So I'm happy I'm speaking in this meeting. Um, what, I, what I plan to do is to uh, convey a few recent developments in the area of expansion, so um, also some of, some of the applications. Uh, what I wrote was SLD and SUD, but most of the talk will be about uh, SUD actually. And what I, what I will uh, give you about, uh, say, results in, in SLD, uh, in some sense it's just an, um, some kind of uh, brief introduction to uh, the, the talk um, Alex Gambert is going to give tomorrow, I hope. Now, um, expander graphs, just recall you a few generalities. There are sparse graphs with high connectivity, and I, I will explain you uh, what, what I mean by that. There are many applications, some of which were already discussed. Efficient communication networks, error correcting codes, de-randomization of random algorithms, quantum computation, group theory, geometry, number theory. Uh, I will not go in, I mean, certainly cannot discuss all of that. Uh, I will probably at some point mention briefly quantum computation. Uh, and also some applications to, uh, to geometry, but we'll definitely not, not discuss the, uh, the, the, other, uh, the other applications, which probably were already touched upon in earlier talks. So we have two notions there. The first is sparse, sparse graph, means that you have a um, few edges. In particular, what you can do is take a K regular graph where k would be fixed and then the number of vertices is going to be uh, is going to become very large. Now, what about high connectivity? A way to express that is in terms of the expansion ratio. So what is expansion ratio? We take arbitrary subsets of uh, the set of the, the vertices. So we have a graph here on n vertices, not too large, say, of size say, bounded by n over 2. And then we look at the ratio between the boundary of the set, which is the number of edges going from S, from S to its complement, over the size uh, of, the, of the, the given set. And the uh, expansion means that this ratio stays uh, bounded away from zero. So what it basically means is that sets, they have a large uh, boundary. When we are talking about expanding families, usually uh, what is, uh, what is uh, considered is a sequence of graphs on a number of vertices which become larger and larger, and then we want over that, that sequence uh, of uh, graphs this uh, expansion ratio, uh, this, this uh, expanding factor, to stay bounded from below by a, strict, by, by a positive number. Uh, over this, this whole family. If you have this phenomenon, then the family uh, under consideration is called an, uh, expanding, uh, an expanding family. Now, it's not, certainly not intuitively clear that such expanding families exist. And there is a, a, say, a work of, uh, of Pinsker in 73, which actually shows that this is generically the case in the following sense. If we fix a k which is at least, to three, uh, at least equal to 3, and we take a um, random k regular graph, k would be fixed here, on n vertices, n going to infinity, then you will have, the, uh, you will have this, this expansion phenomenon I just explained to you. Now, truth of the matter is that uh, I was told by, uh, well, by uh, Peter Sarnak, who got, I believe, the message from uh, Misha Gromov that actually this phenomenon was already known to Kolmogorov. So there is a paper, in, I think, in 67 by uh, Kolmogorov and Brasden, where they already pointed out this, this phenomenon. Anyway, uh, once you, you think about it, then it is not so difficult to verify this, but it's just the first step of believing that, that such, an, uh, such a phenomenon should happen. Now, what if you do not have access to true probability? Well, if you don't have uh, access to, uh, to randomness, truly speaking, then uh, you try to do what this meeting is about, is to rely on pseudo-randomness. And the best, one of the best sources for pseudo-randomness is to exploit algebraic complexity. 
So explicit expander graphs were uh, introduced, say, algebraic, with algebraic constructions, easy algebraic constructions, by Margulis. In general, uh, a natural source of graphs coming from algebra are Cayley graphs on groups. And there is one result which is quite uh, significant in uh, this respect. It's a theorem of Selberg, which may be discussed more uh, tomorrow, but anyway, who has also the following consequence, is that if you start from a finite index, uh, so you, you take an, uh, a finitely generated, say, subgroup of SL2Z, which is finite index, this is important in the statement, and then you look at the reduction, so you can uh, what, what you can do is look at the reduction mod P. So you get a map which goes from SL to Z to SL to P. And you can uh, look at the Cayley graphs which are associated to the image of uh, the set S under this map pi P. Now when P is sufficiently uh, large, you're going to have a connected graph, and moreover, you're going to have an expanding family in the sense that there is an expansion coefficient which is going to be controlled uniformly for p going to infinity and could depend, of course, on the given set S. So that's exactly what we call an expanding family. Now, the relation between this expansion property and uh, the Selberg theorem, the way it is usually uh, understood, which is about uh, spectral gaps, for the, uh, the Laplacian on, on, the, on the hyperbolic quotient is not completely immediate. And my understanding is that, is that this was first pointed out by Peter Boozer. And I won't go into further, further details here. So what is very unsatisfactory is this assumption, very strong assumption there that we assume that we have a finite index subgroup. So how do um, we try to get around that? Well, now we have a statement which is uh, much more general because basically we only require the group generated by S to be non-elementary, so equivalently uh, for, uh, for D equals 2 that it contains a free group. But we can go beyond that and, um, well, so what I mentioned to you here is a problem which is apparently the, the Lubotsky 1, 2, 3 problem. So you have two set, three sets of genera of uh, of uh, sets of elements of SL2Z, you have S1, S2, S3. So S1, S2, they fall under the purview of Selberg's theorem because they are generated finite in the index subgroup. Uh, S3 is not generating a finite index subgroup and whether or not that provides you when you do a reduction of P with an expansion family uh, was not clear and is one of the results that one can now answer in the affirmative. So uh, what I want to, I don't know if this is a completely honest uh, attribution, uh, but I want to uh, convey you with some m uh, a more general uh, phenomenon uh, which goes beyond SL2 and which is the following, uh, the following issue. So what we consider is the same setting. We have a finite subset S of uh, SLD, say SLD over the integers. And I will certainly not assume that S generates a finite index uh, subgroup. I will only require that the group generated by S is a risky dense. So for D equals 2, it just means that the group generated by S contains a free group. Okay? So then the statement is that there is a Q0, uh, which is some integer depending on S, so that if we take uh, moduli Q, which are relative prime with Q0, and we take the reduction mod Q and the corresponding, uh, the corresponding Cayley graphs, you're going to have a family of expanders. Again, family of expanders means that you have a uniform control from below on the expansion coefficient. Uniform over the, the moduli Q, which are relative prime with Q0. Well, uh, what I should say is that First of all, the role of strong the, the role of, of, the, of, the, of the Zariski density, uh, it's exactly the role of the strong approximation property. So uh, there is a following classical theorem which tells you that if you have a Zariski dense subgroup of SLD, then there is a Q0 uh, integer such that when you take the reduction mod Q uh, of G, you're going to have all of SLD Z mod QZ. So that is going to hold for all Q which are relative prime with Q0. Obviously, if you want to have an, expanding, uh, an expander, the least you need 
uh, is to have a connected graph. Once you have a connected graph, you're going to have some expansion. Of course, you want the thing to be uniformly controlled from, from below over the family. But certainly what we need is uh, an, a connected graph. And that is a consequence of the result which I just wrote. So that already introduces you the Q0. So this is a classical result of Matthews, Wasserstein, Weiss failure which was proven unconditionally later without relying on the classification of semi-simple groups by, uh, by Pink. So that, that is a relative, reasonably deep, deep thing. So uh, about the, the, the problem, no, the, it, it is solved. And so this is uh, an affirmative statement. And well, starting from the, the work of uh, Harold, Harold Elfgott, which was absolutely crucial there, uh, there has been uh, many contributions and contributors, and this is an uh, alphabetical list of them to make a longer story quite brief. Now, if you do applications in particular to sieving or to topology, it's also good to have a setting that is uh, valid in the generality of the integers in a number field. So what I will consider here is an extension Complete anything. Not anymore. Uh, Not anything. Okay. Anything. anything. Well, I'll you. give you the paper. <laughs> no, it's a good result. Yeah. Uh, so, in the number field setting, we have to be a bit more careful. So, we are considering the embeddings of the number field in the complex. Uh, we are taking again a finite uh, symmetric subset of SLD over the integers of your number field and the generated group. So um, now I just want to advertise the result of Peter Varjo, which is a natural extension of what I just said. Uh, what we assume is that um, if we take the joint embedding from uh, the, the, the joint map from, from the, the different embeddings, well, we assume that the image of the group generated by gamma is the risky dense in the r fold power of SLDC, which is a necessary condition. Then we have the same statement, except that at this point the statement was only obtained uh, in the square free case. So we have an ideal J, which plays the role of the Q0, so that if you take the reduction uh, mod I, where I ran ranges in square free uh, ideals of O which are prime to J, then we have an expanding family. And well, say in particular the situation where uh, we would uh, consider, <laughs> instead of the integers, we would consider, say, uh, the, the, Gauss, the Gaussian integers, it's quite important in the applications. Applications, well, that's something I will not discuss uh, now. Maybe Gambert uh, will say more about that. So there are, first of all, the applications basically are all about SL2. That, uh, SL2 integers, SL2 uh, of the, of the Gauss uh, integers. So typical applications uh, include hyperbolic lattice point counting, uh, generalizations of, uh, so hyperbolic lattice point counting uh, combined with generalizations of uh, Selberg's theorem, because obviously you can expect you're getting a generalization of Selberg's theorem, because you can go now from uh, finite, uh, finite index subgroups to basically anything, to, to groups that, that, have, uh, that, that have arbitrary small uh, dimension in terms of, of the limit set. And that in turn has uh, applications to uh, sieving. So all that you can find in a, in a paper that just appeared, a uh, joint paper with uh, Alex Gambert and Peter Sarnak. And then regarding sieving, there has been later work by Kontorovic, uh, Kontorovic and uh, O for the uh, applications to the Apollonian packings, and then also some recent work of uh, Kontorovic and myself. Applications to, to topology, uh, I'm definitely not an expert uh, in that. Uh, this is the virtual Haken conjecture positive Hegard gradients informal uh, Hegart gradients of covers of hyperbolic tree manifolds, which is particular work of uh, uh, Long, Alex Lubotsky, and, and Reed, uh, following on the uh, work of, of uh, Lack and B. So there are a number of uh, interesting 
applications, developments in, in this direction, but I will, not, uh, I will not discuss that here. What I want to do is to go more in the SU2, SUD direction. So um, basically, what uh, I'm going to do is start from a um, set of uh, elements, uh, G1, GK, in uh, SU2, and I will, well, uh, I will assume that these elements are algebraic and generate an, uh, a free group. Uh, the, the role of taking these elements algebraic is, in a sense, minor, but, but still plays, plays a decisive role at the, the very start, which has to do with uh, Gener realizing a so-called non-commutative Diophantine property, which is much more than we need, but still, uh, basically, this is this is the way, the only way we can do things right now. Fortunately, this restriction that we take algebraic uh, elements for the, I would say, for all the, the natural applications. It, it's not really a problem because the elements you, you're dealing with, whether it's in quantum computation or in, in problems of, of chaotic, uh, chaotic crystals, the, the objects you are dealing with are algebraic anyway. So fortunately, this is not really a problem. But let me point out that I do not expect that this assumption of taking algebraic elements is really crucial in making the next statement that if we take the associated Heck operator, we would have a spectral gap. So the spectral gap, uh, so that is, if you want, the counterpart of the expansion of the Cayley graphs in SLD, I just, uh, uh, just uh, discussed briefly, which can be rephrased, your spectral gap, your uh, expansion can, of, can as, is well, as is well known, can be rephrased in terms of uh, uh, spectral gaps for the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. So here we state it directly in terms of the spectral gap of the, uh, of the Heck operator. Now, capital what is... K, what? Capital K is the same as little k? Um, yes. Yes, you will see many more of these, of these things. <laughs> so, uh, just warn you. So, now, the, the gamma is actually controlled, is completely controlled by this non-commutative Diophantine property, which was introduced at the time in a paper of Gamble Jacobson, uh, Peter Sarnak, and what it tells you is that not only we have, say, assume that you have an, uh, uh, well, let me phrase it like that. So you have, you have this, this collection G, G1, GK, uh, which uh, is the, the alphabet, the elements you're starting uh, from, uh, which I will assume generate an, uh, a free group, say. I will come back to that in a moment. And then you can look at the words, you can look at the words of length L, or you can also look at the reduced words of uh, length L. So this uh, non-commutative Diophantine property tells you that you have uh, some lower bound on how close these elements of WLG can come to the identity if we assume that they are not the identity. So if we have an element G which is not one word of length L, then we get a lower bound by a constant A at some power. Of course, it has to degenerate when L becomes large, but it goes power exponentially in L. With a certain, say, A, A is going to depend on G. And it is the A which eventually determines, gets you a halt on the gamma in the spectral gap. As you will see, in case I can reach the end of the talk, uh, there is also some importance of understanding what happens when the little k gets large. And then you want to see what you, what you can do uh, in terms of, un of uniformity uh, of spectral gap. Of course, uh, what uh, is going to happen if the little k is large, well, after, if you look at words of length L, if you do a random walk of, of, of length L, you're going to have a number of elements which is roughly like a k to the power L. So it's certainly the best you can hope for is that the one minus G uh, is going to be bigger than K minus L or K minus a constant times L, or something like that. 
And as it turns out, if we have that kind of uniformity, which is basically the, the best possible you can hope for, then essentially you can kind of have things which are uniform uh, in terms of K. This may sound like a void discussion, but uh, it, it plays a role at, at some point when, in case I can discuss a little bit uh, dimension as one of the applications, the problem of dimension expansion, which I believe was briefly uh, brought up um, yesterday in Avi's talk. So, tradition, uh, so historically, these uh, problems of expansion, SU2, SUD, they have various applications. And of course, there is the Banach-Rosievich problem. There is also the obvious applications to, con to quantum computation. There is a very nice application to geometry, which is the Conway-Radin Conway uh, tilings of R3. And there are uh, applications which are less obvious to problems of constructing monotone expanders and uh, the, the dimension expansion problem. And, well, the way it goes, I may be able to say something about these different items. Now, what is a more recent result is the situation in SUD. So in SUD, uh, what we are considering are elements G1, GK, again, um, which are algebraic. In fact, there is, yeah, I, I, I probably didn't tell you that uh, in, 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 in relation to SU2. If you have algebraic elements, you will have this non-commutative De Fontein property, right? Because you can control it in terms of the height. Of the, of the input. So same thing here, we're going to take elements G1, uh, GK in SUD, which are algebraic. And well, now we have to assume more, it's not too, uh, enough to take a, a free group because uh, SUD has, for D larger than two, has uh, non-trivial subgroups that may get you into trouble here. So what I will assume is that gamma is dense. Now you can formulate it in, in many ways. You can require the group gamma to be Zariski dense in SLDC, or what is perhaps geometrically more, set, uh, geometrically more intuitive is just to assume uh, that the group generated by gamma is topologically dense in SUD. This is also what fits better the application, for instance, to the solovic type algorithm. And then you can again look at the corresponding heck operator, and it has a spectral gap, uh, spectral gap which is going to depend on the data G1, GK. So a few comments to make things um, a bit uh, more concrete. By work of Tietz and then Breuer uh, Gelander, you can take, you can replace your set G1, GK by a set uh, of two uh, elements, G1, G2, that generate uh, a free group, which is still the risky dense. And uh, one, of course, one issue that has to be, there are many steps in improving this, this spectral gap, but one issue that will certainly appear is how to use this risky density to show that we have an escape property. Uh, so an escape property will mean that if you take your random walk on this, on this set, say, of, of two generators, after L steps, you like to say that uh, the probability to be stuck in a proper closed subgroup is going to be relatively small. In fact, they want, they need to have it exponentially decaying when L go to infinity. For D equals two, this is an issue which is relatively easy uh, to, ad well, to address because basically there you only have to deal with, uh, with uh, free groups, uh, say elementary algebra on the free group, and then things like the, the Keston, Keston estimate for the random work on the free group, things like that. While in the present situation, uh, say that there, is, there is more uh, involved in particular uh, I, I use uh, the theory of random matrix products and um, stuff like that, uh, say the Tietz method and so on. Uh, so that, that is definitely a problem. I will discuss it a little bit, which is one of, of the difficulties in extending from D equals two to uh, D, D larger than two. There are basically two steps in this proof. The first proof, the first step, the, the first part of the proof 
uh, is to, to show that you can, by taking enough convolutions, get something which is rather flat. And um, that part is using techniques from arithmetic combinatorics, such, that, such as approximate groups you may have heard about, and also things like some products, say discretized uh, ring theorem, <coughs> things like that. And also, of course, at that stage, the, there will be an issue about escape because you definitely don't want to, to, be, to be stuck in, in some proper subgroup, proper closed subgroup. So there will also be these, these, these random matrix uh, product techniques coming in. So the main proposition is the following. So first of all, you will fix a scale delta. So delta is a number that will go to zero. Uh, it is convenient to introduce an approximate identity because we have a continuous group here. So this is P sub delta, which is just the indicator function of a small ball, say centered at the identity of radius delta and normalized in measure. And I will let delta vary and use that as my approximate identity. So what I want to say, so this is the, the first main proposition, is that I, if I start convolving the measure nu, so I do a random walk on nu, I convolve L times, so this mu sub L is an L-fold convolution of nu, which corresponds to a random walk of length L, with L which is reasonably bounded in terms of delta. Basically, L is bounded by the logarithm of 1 over delta up to some factor. Well, I can get, after convolving with P delta, what I get there is a function, and I can get it basically almost flat. I like to get it bounded, but what I can do is get infinity norm less than delta to the power minus tau, where tau, tau will be some, some constant here independent of, uh, independent of delta. Basically, tau eventually is only going to depend on d. So that is the first thing. And then once you have that, then you can bring into play methods from representation theory. There is a technique uh, which was introduced by, uh, by Sarnak and Chu, and I will show you another technique in order to prove the actual spectral gap. So, um, yeah, what is the, the main lemma there is what would imply the proposition. Basically, how do you prove this, this proposition? Uh, well, you, you, do a bunch of, uh, you, you do a bunch of convolutions, so with an L which is of the order of log 1 over delta, you get something, and then what you like to, to do is to get the thing flatter and flatter by taking further convolutions. So basically what I'm going to apply there is a finite number, is, is a bounded number of times, what they call main lemma, which tells you that if at some stage L the L2 norm, new L convolved with P delta, it's still too large. I want to reach delta minus 2, well, assume it's more, delta minus gamma. Then I will replace L by 2L, which means that I do one more convolution and I want to get it a little bit better. So I want to gain a factor there, delta to the power kappa. And then if I keep going, eventually I'm going to reach delta minus 2 in, in a few steps. So to get proposition, uh, what what will be shown is this, this main lemma, which is, as I said, the, the heart of the matter in the, the first part. Now, before we're doing that and that I lost your attention completely, uh, let me show you something which is uh, rather nice, which is an alternative approach to this, the second part, where you want to, to show that you have an actual uh, spectral gap. So, Originally, there was an argument which was more representation theoretic, but as it uh, turns out, there, there is a, a way to do it, which at least for a harmonic analyst like me is in some sense more, more pleasing. Also, it's, it's rather robust. So let's try to do it for SU2, and instead of SU2, I will work with SO3 and consider the representation of the, of the group uh, SO3 on the two-sphere. This is not capturing uh, all the unit representations of SU2, only half of them, but there is a little twist you can do to get the rest of it also. So let's just uh, focus on that representation and try to prove that we have a spectral gap. So if we don't have a spectral gap, it means that you have a function uh, in L2 on the sphere. 
uh, which is of mean zero and which is approximately constant for the action of this uh, heck operator T. So what we have is that the L2 norm of T of F is almost one, one minus epsilon. Epsilon here is a small number. And by taking epsilon too small, you like to have a contradiction. Uh, right. Now, there is something in this argument, something amazing that is going to, exploit, to be exploited. It's that on one hand, SO3, it's really a three-dimensional object. While the representation, it's on L2 of, an, of a manifold, which is the two, the two sphere, which is only two-dimensional. And this allows for certain uh, considerations, which uh, eventually is going to show me that there is a problem. So, first of all, well, you can, what you need is some kind of standard harmonic analysis decomposition of your L2 space. So, if you are, if you are a harmonic analyst, there is something called the little wood pali decomposition, which you just produce with an approximate, uh, with a, an approximate uh, identity. So, what I'm introducing here are dyadic blocks delta kf. So, f can be written as a sum of these dyadic blocks delta kf. And delta kf is defined by uh, taking the convolution with P2 minus K and subtracting the convolution with uh, P2 minus K plus one. Say on a very, very rough scale, and this is not correct, of course, but to kind of give a little bit uh, the, um, the sense of what is going on. The delta KF are functions which in some sense are constant on scale two minus K and are of mean zero on a slightly larger scale. That's what it means. So we have an nice L2 uh, property in the sense that the square of the L2 norm of F is the sum of the squares, so the things add up the right way. And so uh, what we, so there is a small technicality here. And so what I assumed was that F was an approximate fixed point. I'm going to take a large integer L0, which is going to be still independent, of course, uh, of, well, I mean, you should think of L0 as basically being a constant here. And, well, if epsilon is sufficiently small and I convolve f with an L-fold convolution of nu, what I'm going to have is a lower bound instead of 1 minus epsilon. So here you had... Uh, sorry. So here you had tf, which is a convolution with nu, is bigger than 1 minus epsilon. If you do it L times, then you're going to have 1 minus epsilon at the power L0. And if epsilon is small, L0 is fixed here, epsilon is, it take epsilon sufficiently small, that's still going to be larger than a half. And then what you do is that you exploit this decomposition, this little wood pali decomposition, to replace the function f by one of its increments. So you can replace f by delta kf for some k, which is going to be large, and has basically, uh, well, what you're going to have uh, is the property that that uh, increment delta kf normalized in L2, which I called capital F, convolved with new L0, it's still going to have an L2 norm, which is larger than, than C. So what is this C? Basically, this C is the half multiplied with whatever the, the, factor, uh, the, the, the factor which, uh, which, which I lost. Here there is some, some kind of numerical factor. I mean, it may depend on the dimension of the group. There's some numerical factor involved. Anyway, this is a constant C, uh, which remains independent of uh, K and allows me to choose my delta. Now, the argument looks technical, but as you will see, it's, ex it's, it's basically extremely simple. So now, once I have the K, I will take my delta. Basically, the delta is an exponential in K. So, because that function f is approximately constant on scale delta, the f and the f convolved with p delta are about the same. Now, once I have the delta, then I go back to this, this flattening lemma, uh, which was, um, which was uh, formulated in the proposition. So, the proposition is applied for this particular delta. And I know that if I convolve nu L times with L proportional to the log of one over delta, I can get this thing um, very flat. So what I need, so L0, L is the L from before. That should be 
bigger than is going to be of the order of, the order of log 1 over delta. And what I'll get from that is a convolution with, uh, so new uh, L0 L convolved P delta gives you a measure mu, which is going to be almost flat in the sense that the two norm is less than delta minus 2. Now, tau you should think of, like I said, as a constant, say 1 over 10 or something. Again, because you have the property which is here, right? Here. If you keep, if you keep convolving, then you're going to have what is written here. Yeah, I don't have an, uh, a pointer. So you're going to have this lower bound here. No, because the condition is L0, L bigger than some C log 1 over delta, this little C at the power L, what you should think about, uh, you should think of C at the power L as a small power of delta. So you write down what it means, and then you use what you know about the mu, namely that mu is uh, almost, uh, mu is satisfying this L2 bound, which is another small power of 1 over delta. So the conclusion is that eventually I'm, I'm getting this expression. No, this expression has absolutely nothing to do anymore with the, the random walk. This is something that, that just depends on the given representation. And that expression is going to be bigger than a small power of delta. Now, why is this interesting? Because we know something about f, right? We know that f is basically, uh, the, the f was at such a uh, dyadic increment with a k that relates to delta like, uh, you took delta like 4 minus k. Now, the, the punchline of the argument is the following. All you can do with that is just write down what it is. So you write down what this thing really means, and what you see is that you will have three variables there. Two variables are taken in the sphere, and the third variable is taken in the group. But the group is three-dimensional. So, because you have a three-dimensional object, if you use the action of the group G to specify GX to be Z, so I have X and Y and GX that they call Z, then there is still a little bit freedom because I still have basically one dimension of freedom. So, what I can do for the last factor is make an average on, on a one-dimensional object which is just which is, as you, you can clearly see, which is just the circle which is centered at z and has an angular radius which is the same as the angular distance between x and y. Because obviously, uh, what are the only constraints? The, the distance between gx and gy, it's the same as the distance between x and y. So after I have fixed gx to be z, I still have a little bit of freedom on g of y. So I can introduce a spherical average which is just here a circle average of f. And that works out quite well because if you are a harmonic analyst again, then you know very well that spherical averages are smoothing operators. So uh, what you know in particular in dimension for the, the one-dimensional sphere, say for the, for the circle, if you average a function in the plane on a circle and you, you see what happens with uh, the L2 norm of the average. If I know that the function f has a Fourier transform which lives away from zero, after doing this, this convolution, this, this averaging on, on circle, so I convolute with the circle, the L2 norm is going to decay quite a bit. And the, the exponent, it's just the Fourier transform, just depends on the Fourier transform of the circle, which is, which is a half. So what you're going to have is that the L2 norm of the circle average of f, so a theta f, a theta is an operator, okay, which is average on circles, uh, of, on, on the circle of radius, uh, spherical radius theta centered at the point z. So given a function f, you have a function a theta of f, and this function a theta of f will have an L2 norm, which in our case, here you will use that f is, is the delta kf, which is bounded by uh, 2k times the radius of the circle at the power minus a half. So that gives me a possibility to estimate very simply this expression. 
by just fixing x and, and y and then playing with z, take the L2 norm of f, take the L2 norm of this guy, and then you just uh, use the bound a, a road here. So um, you plug it in and, and you get exactly what, what you want because what you're going to have is an upper bound in terms of 2 at the power k, say 2 minus k over 2 or something like that, which is a definite power of delta, but we know on the other hand that what we have is a lower bound, which is a small power of delta. So this thing doesn't work. It gets you a contradiction. Proves you the, the spectral gap. Now, you can try to do a proof in um, uh, greater uh, generality for SUD, but in fact, it is not quite... Well, I mean, one way to, to, to do it is actually instead of finding an analog of this argument, it's just using that you have the result for SU2. And, well, I just want to point you out to something that seems to be quite basic. It's, it's a very simple harmonic analysis principle. So assume that you want that you do the same argument in SUD. Now, we don't use the representation for an, uh, uh, say, the, the action on, on functions on, on a lower dimensional manifold but we just take the regular representation. Just let uh, G act on L2 of, of the group. Take the regular representation. And you can do exactly the same argument, except that you don't have the final step. So what I'm getting here, again, is the statement that F, F is, is defined the same way uh, as, a, as a delta K F normalized, will have a convolution with itself, uh, which has a large L2 norm, bigger than a small power of delta. So this is just the step which was so what I wrote here, you just can write, considering instead of the, the rho j, the representation on L2 of the sphere, you just take the regular representation. So um, then you like to have a contradiction. So there is a following statement, uh, which I think is, is quite, quite nice, which is really harmonic analysis uh, on uh, SUD. This is grossly false for d equals 1, by the way. It tells you the following. Assume that you have bounded, say for simplicity, take bounded functions F1 and F2 uh, on the group, and assume that uh, F1, say, I, I take a delta small, assume that F1 convolved with uh, a delta approximate identity small. So F1 is assumed to have this, this property here, which basically means that the Fourier transform of, of F1 is going to live away, far away, okay? in some quantitative uh, setting. So what I can do then is take the convolution by F1 as an operator acting on L2 of the group. In particular, I can convolve, I can convolve it with the function F2, which can be anything here. So instead of taking L2, I'll take, say, take, take functions which are bounded by 1. Well, there is a uniform estimate of that kind. So this, this, this C prime is, 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 an, is an absolute constant. Note that this is a result which is certainly not valid for the circle because if you would take a character on the circle far away, well, if I give you delta and I take my character far away, this thing is going to be basically zero. I mean, the circle is going to have this, this property. Now, if you convolve this character with itself, you still get, get the same character. So you certainly don't have this property. So it's, it's very much a non-commutative thing. So if you have this convolution lemma, you get a contradiction. On the, for, for the, the previous statement, because you know that your f is a delta k f, so it, it has this property. f has this property. So you would have, in particular, f convolved with f, which, which is going to be that small, and it's not that small, because that's a small power of delta. So how do you prove this convolution lemma? Well, I will not go into that, but there is an easy way to prove this convolution lemma just by using that it is true for d equals 2, which basically follows from the previous argument and then using an embedding of an SU2 subgroup, do it any way you want, inside SUD, and start moving this, this group around with left and right multiplication. That match for the, the part which is representation theory. Now, the arithmetic combinatorics, um, as I said, there are several uh, ingredients, and some of these ingredients are not really special for, for SU, SU2 or SUD. They have also been used uh, in the SLD uh, theory. 
this that is in particular the notion of an approximate group. Now an approximate group that has a priori nothing to do with the true algebraic group. But of course what we like to show is that it eventually it has some kind of structure, right? So uh, the, the result which is involved is now usually referred to as the balok semery de gauss uh, result and in the form, which is really a graph theoretical statement, and in the form I'm using it, it was, uh, it was uh, stated, it was proved uh, by, by Tau for uh, compact continuous groups and also for, uh, for locally compact uh, groups. Now, that is the result that allows me to go from set theoretical statements to statistical statements. So coming back to what I really want to prove, which is this, um, this, uh, this proposition, this, this lemma here. So how does it work? Well, you go by contradiction. You call mu the object which is, which is here. And you assume that it is not as small as you want in L2. And then you convolve mu with itself. And you hope that it's going to get better. So suppose that it's not getting better then what you essentially have is that the L2 norm of mu convolved with mu, it's about as, as large as the L2 norm of mu. Kappa chosen as small as I want, say, still some, some constant. What I get is a situation where um, I have, sorry, uh, see. I have this measure mu which is uh, the L-fold convolution of nu, and I have <coughs> phenomenon, so L is like the log of one over delta, phenomenon that if you convolve mu with itself, convolve with P delta, the L2 norm is about as large. That sign here carries a small power of delta, which I will ignore because it doesn't, doesn't play. Now what, what does this uh, statement tells you then? Well, what it tells you is that you can find a subset H of the group G, which is a union of delta balls. Uh, you can take it symmetric. The set H is more or less stable under multiplication, which is not surprising because you're doing a uh, convolution of, of the measure mu uh, on, on the group. So the set H is almost stable under multiplication and more precisely, what you have is another set, which is now a finite set X, and such that if you take uh, H times H, it's going to be contained in H times X and X times H. Note that if you have this property, not only you control, so X is, is small, right? X is a small power, X is, is bounded in size. This is cardinality here, this is measure. So the size of X, cardinality of X is bounded by small power of one over delta. Uh, note that if you know this property, it gives you a halt on all, power, on, on all products, product sets of H. So you can look at H times H times H. So if you multiply one more time with H, well, because you have that, you can multiply here with H, and then H times H is contained in X times H. So H times H times H is going to be contained in X times X times H. But X is a small set. So what you have under control is actually the measure of not only the, the twofold product set, but all, pro, all, all finite, all product sets of H with, with a bounded number of factors, right? So what we, so these properties, this is what you refer to as an approximate group. Now, what you have more about uh, this H, well, you have to say its relation to mu. So what you also know is that the measure of mu is going to put a lot of mass on H or on some cosets of coset of H. So you also have this property. Now you could have H to be the, the, the whole group and then the, there would be essentially nothing set. So there is one more property is that H has a small measure. So gamma here you should think as, as a fixed constant and epsilon would be, would be very small here. So how are we going to get a contradiction? Well the rough idea is that we're going to use in some sense that mu is not anything. So mu is this L-fold convolution of mu, and the support of mu generates as a risky dense group. So that has to be used to show that the, the only way 
say, if, if we know that, that mu puts uh, a lot of mass on, on some set, right, in particular this, this coset here of H, necessarily the set is not going to be in any sense contained in a proper subgroup. So that has to do with what we know about the measure mu. Now, once we know that the set is not contained in a proper subgroup, then by techniques of arithmetic uh, combinatorics like this traced ring and uh, these, these random matrix products, what we're going to show is that there is some product set, say of, of a certain number of, of copies of H, which is under control, say in terms of the, uh, of, of, of the well, in terms of the group and, and of the gamma. What imports is that we have no dependence on delta, so we're going to look at the product set, say, of 10 copies of H, and that product set is, is going to be almost all of the group. And then we have a contradiction because I just told you that any product set of H cannot be uh, too large. So H itself is of size, is of measure delta to the power gamma. If I take the tenfold product set of H, the measure of this is going to be bounded because of, of these properties by delta to the power gamma times one over delta at the power, say, 10 times epsilon. And epsilon is very small. So we know that these product sets cannot be too large. So that is then eventually giving me the, the contradiction. So the main steps. There is a first step, which is the construction of almost diagonal sets. And in a way, the, the, the procedure which is uh, used there goes back uh, to the, the first paper in this line of research, which was the, the paper of uh, Helfgott uh, on SL2P. So we are going to introduce diagonal sets because after all, it's much more pleasant to work with diagonal sets, which is basically sets in some Cartesian product of the complex numbers, than elements, uh, say, sets, sets in the group, which is not exactly obvious to, well, I mean, the other thing is also not obvious, but we have we already have at our disposal a certain machinery to create structured subsets in the uh, abelian setting that you would take, say, a set of, that, or, say, a Cartesian product, complex numbers, real complex numbers or Cartesian products of these. So we already have this machinery, so we kind of like to bring it back to, to, that, uh, to that kind of uh, uh, results we have. So if you have a diagonal set, essentially you get a set in some uh, Cartesian power of the complex. Then we can, okay, so what's the interest? Once you are there, you have a tool which is a discretized string theorem and which is going to allow you to produce something which is structured. So what you're going to get in particular is something that looks like an approximate line segment in a neighborhood of the identity. And that part is basically completely independent of the group. So you don't really care what, what is the group so much. Then where you have to start exploiting the, the structure of the, the properties of having a Zariski dense support is when you want to amplify and recover a whole neighborhood of the identity. So there it becomes important that you are not, uh, that your things are, uh, that your, your, your set, your approximate group uh, is not going to be essentially contained in a closed subgroup. And that well, you're going to create a neighborhood in some product set of H. Uh, that is, is what uh, gives you a contradiction because this is a rather large neighborhood and you get in particular that the size of this H prime is, is, is much too large to be compatible with, uh, with the, the, the bounds, the bounds I, I, had, uh, I had there. So, um, yeah. I will not state you the discretized uh, ring theorem here, but what I will state you is a consequence, which is really all I need, which is the following. This really makes use of a minimal amount of assumptions. So what I have just is a subset A of the default Cartesian product of the complex numbers, a set uh, consisting of elements bounded by one. And so I have a scale delta, Take the, so Na delta is the number of delta separated elements of A. So let's assume that it's bigger than one over delta to some power. This can be extremely general set. So what I'm saying then is that I can produce an approximate segment within uh, what you may call a sum product set. So A, uh, 
subscript S is just the S fault product of A. And um, what I'm looking for here is a subset of S subscript S, which is an S fault subset. And then I, I subtract the same object. So what I have is a subset of a product set. Important thing being that S is completely under control. S is independent of delta. So what that says is that this sum product set will contain a segment in, so you have a vector, say unit vector in CD, and I get the segment zero delta to the gamma, uh, a segment of length delta to the gamma in direction C, which is going to be contained in that sum product set up to an error, up to a perturbation, which is much, which is, which is much smaller. So that uh, property is, is not obvious, but I will not go into detail uh, in that. Uh, it is put together with the following uh, statement, uh, which is the existence of diagonal sets. So what we have, like I said, we take the group generated by two elements, uh, G1, G2, uh, generating a free group. At that stage, the risky density is completely irrelevant. So we take the words of length L and we take a subset of these, a subset of these words which is about the right size. So we take a set uh, which is uh, of size exponential in, in L. And then we can produce a subset A of some product set of H. S is uh, independent. Uh, S is, is uh, you should think of S as being a, a constant. It's independent of L. Uh, which have the property, so these elements that they produce in an appropriate orthonormal basis, they become approximately uh, diagonal. So the distance to the diagonal is going to be bounded by delta. And delta basically is an exponent, is an exponential in L. And I have enough of these elements, so the, the, say the elements I, I will choose are delta separated. The number of elements is a power of one over delta. Delta is, one over delta is like a power of L. So that is what gives me a possibility to get inside a commutative setting because I'm introducing elements which are basically diagonal elements. And then you have to put it together, you put it together with, uh, you don't have to, but that's the way that my argument goes. Uh, you put it together with the discretized string theorem, produce an approximate segment, and from there on, uh, the uh, question becomes escape. Because once you have a segment, so basically you get, assume that you have a segment there in the Lie algebra, and you want to get more. So how do, how do you get more? Well, you look at the adjoint representation. Now, the, the adjoint representation of the elements uh, in, in, the, in the group I'm starting with, and more precisely, what we have to see is that, uh, like I pointed out, if we look at the random walk associated to new in the joint representation, then the probability to get stuck in a proper subspace is going to become exponentially small when um, exponentially small in the, the length of the random walk. Now, how do we get that? What is written here is, is a consequence, which is a quantitative consequence, knowing that we are dealing, that we are starting from a new which is supported by algebraic elements and using some quantitative uh, Nullstell and that's, I don't want to get into that. But this problem is a non-trivial one because this is exactly where we're going to use that the measure nu uh, generates a Zariski dense group. So our main tool is a result which I believe goes back to Furstenberg and tells you that if we have a representation which uh, acts strongly reducibly, which means that you don't have a finite union of proper linear spaces which remains invariant and has a proximal element. Proximal means that there is some element of your semigroup with a simple dominating eigenvalue. Then uh, we are in business and we can get the kind of estimate we want. So that is the result we like to apply in our situation of the adjoint representation on the Lie algebra. But the trouble is that well, I mean, the joint representation acting on the whole group, SUD, is certainly strongly reducible. But uh, 
so also when I restrict to my gamma, since gamma is a risky dense, it's, it's, still, strong, it's still going to be strongly reducible. But uh, what is not at all clear is how you make sure that you have these proximal elements. Because if you look at it, you're not going to, I mean, you take uh, eigen, eigen values of unitary matrices, you're going to have a modulus which is going to be one, right? So how do we get around that? Well, there is a method of TITS. Basically, what you do is that you take an element which has two eigenvalues, which roots are not, uh, which uh, quotient, so you have two eigenvalues, which quotient is not a root of unity. And then you go to a local field, which can be in a periodic, can be an ultrametric, can be a periodic field, to separate uh, these eigenvalues in the, proper, in the proper absolute value. So what you have is a different field. You put your field in, in, some, in some local field, and uh, you get a situation where one of the elements of your semigroup at least has not all eigenvalues of the same size. But that doesn't give you yet a dominating eigenvalue. So the method to do that is to go to wedge products. You see, if you would have uh, lambda 1 and lambda 2, which are the same in size, say, for instance, the same, and then you have uh, lambda 3, etc., which are smaller in size, then you go to a two-fold wedge product, and you get, uh, you get lambda 1 times lambda 2 that becomes a dominating, uh, and, uh, simple dominating eigenvalue. So you go to your wedge product, and uh, fine, uh, you get uh, in that wedge product, so you have a wedge product of the um, uh, of the adjoint representation of uh, uh, SUD, where uh, your representation has a proximal element. But if you go to that wedge product, what you lose is, of course, the, the reducibility. So you have to go to a reducible, uh, irreducible component. And if it is at least two-dimensional, this is where Titz concludes, he gets his free group, and basically that's what he wanted to do. But this is not enough for us. So we have to get back out of this thing and understand what it means for the original problem. So that requires some, at least for me, that took, took some work. So the applications, um, I think I still have, what, 10 minutes or 15 minutes? 10. Or 10 minutes. So there are classical applications to quantum computation in the Solovic-Kitaev uh, algorithm. I will not um, discuss uh, here, maybe. Uh, there is also the application to um, aperiodic uh, tilings, uh, which I can say you something about. So we sh should get back to the, the tilings of, of pen rows, which are two-dimensional uh, aperiodic tilings of the plane. But if you look at the orientations, there is, there is a very slow growth in the volume. And it has to do with the fact that, after all, the orthogonal, orthogonal group uh, in, in, in two dimensions, it doesn't offer much mixing, right? So to try to find uh, tilings which have a more rapid, uh, gives you, say, aperiodic tilings where the number of orientations is growing faster in the volume, it makes sense to go to higher dimension, and this is exactly what uh, Conway and Radin did. They developed a three-dimensional, they introduced a three-dimensional tiling of, um, of uh, space, in uh, congruent uh, prisms, I will describe you the, the process in a moment, uh, that actually uh, at least was conjectured to give you orientations that are very rapidly growing uh, in, the, in the volume as fast as one can basically uh, hope for. And what they conjectured eventually was proven using exactly the, the theory of expansion in, uh, in SU2, as SO3, the results I mentioned to you. So uh, the way you construct this, um, this uh, tiling is as follows. You start from the, uh, the, the mother uh, tile, uh, which is a prism with uh, dimensions 1, 1, square root 3, and 2. Somehow the square root of 3 is quite important there. And then you decompose it. It may not be completely clear what you really do, but basically you, you decompose it in eight uh, daughter tiles, 
which are uh, homothetic with the factor a half, by splitting the guy in a front and a back part, and then the front part, you get one dot of tail here, you just get, get its nose, and then the, the back, you have the upper one, and then the lower two dot of tails are obtained by splitting like that. In the back, you do it differently. You take again the front part, and then for the back, you have, you have something that is symmetric with respect to the front part, and then the top is cut in two like that. And then you do a rescaling, and uh, what governs, eventually governs, the orientations, if you uh, do this process, it's not a free group, but um, some uh, amal amalgamated product of a free group in particular contains a free group, which allows you to say something about the underlying heck operator. So what uh, Conway and Radin showed is that the, the quackoversal tiling, as they called it, is statistically invariant under all rotations. Now, at what rate do the orientations approach uniform distribution? So we want to introduce some kind of chaotic quasi-crystalline. It's, so it, it's a typical example of pseudo-randomness. So we have something which is completely deterministic, and you like to say that these orientations would behave like a random choice of orientations. So as a consequence of the result on SU2, which is in, in a paper with Alex Gambert, uh, what we obtain is that uh, the, the orientations grow exponentially fast in the number of subdivisions, um, which corresponds with the spectral gap of the associated uh, heck operator. Note that this associated heck operator is not self-adjoint, but for some mysterious reason, the eigenvalues are real, which is still not, not explained as far as I know. Anyway, to talk about spectral gaps, there is no need to have self-adjoint operators. Uh, the techniques from arithmetic combinatorics, they give you poor results. But interestingly, in this problem, the results, they have to be poor because it was checked by numerics that the, the best possible rate you could have was like that, and as you can see, this number is very close to one. In fact, it was kind of amazing they, they dare to make uh, such, an, uh, such a conjecture on the base of, of numerics, because, re because actually already going to spherical harmonics of, of degree 258, you see that, uh, that you get a spectral gap so you check your heck operator on spherical harmonics, right? And then you see what happens with the largest, non with, with the, the largest uh, eigenvalue. And, and, and what happens is that you really get very close to one. So if that already happens at 258, you, you can start wondering uh, what, is, uh, what is going to, to happen later. Nevertheless, they made a conjecture, and the conjecture turned out to be true. Um, the final application is uh, dimension expansion, so since time is running out, uh, I will just uh, formulate you the theorem. This is what I believe uh, Avi was briefly mentioning at the end of his talk. So, uh, a priori, this problem has absolutely nothing to do with uh, whatever I discussed before about expansion linear groups, but it turns out that these techniques allow you to, to solve it. So I don't know exactly what is the computer science motivation for the question, but roughly what we want to do is, is the following. We want to uh, find a fixed set of linear transformation. So, sorry, what we want to, to find is a set of a few linear transformations on uh, n-dimensional linear space, and n goes to infinity, and say, take it over your favorite uh, field for instance, a field with two elements. And the, the transformations, linear transformations uh, introduced should have the property that if I take any linear subspace, say, of half dimension, and I look at all the images of this linear subspace under my transformations, the space generated by this, say, assume AI, uh, I have A1, A2, A3, say, so I take the space generated by A1V, A2V, A3V, I want it to be of a dimension which is larger than the dimension of the, of the given space, V, with a gain, say, by a fraction alpha. And that should be true for any linear subspace. Um, 
for any linear subspace V uh, of dimension, say, bounded by N over 2. So, uh, in a paper that appeared a few years ago, uh, Alex Lubotsky and Zelmanov solved this problem, at least for characteristic zero, using property T and, and um, exploiting a representation, the, the, the adjoint representation uh, of uh, some, some group of, uh, with, with property T acting uh, on the space of Hilbert, Hilbert Schmidt operators. And then basically you can you can control dimension by looking at the, the Hilbert speed norm of the corresponding projection. But this technique apparently uh, does not quite work in, um, in uh, dimension in characteristic zero, where there was another method introduced in work, I will skip the details there, by Dvir and, and, uh, and Spilka, which is based on the notion of uh, monotone expanders. So, basically, what is a monotone expander? Well, you have, you take the integers from 1 up to n, and then you consider a set of maps from 1 up to n to itself, which are monotone. Now, if you want that, you don't have too much choices, right? So, to give some possibility of, of different choices, we don't require that the map is everywhere defined. So, there is a symbol there which means that the map may not be defined somewhere. But in case it is defined in two integers for two elements x and y with x less than y, then we want uh, phi x to be less than phi y. So assume that you have a set of such monotone maps. You can introduce a graph on the vertices, which is a set of integers up to n, by, by joining x and y, provided um, there is an i where phi i, such that uh, phi i is, is defined uh, at, at x and phi i of x is equal to y. And what they observed is that if this graph has an expanding property, then you can fabricate a dimension expander. And this dimension expander, it's very easily described. You just let these maps act on the basis. So for each of these maps which act uh, on integers from 1 up to n, you can introduce a linear operator T phi by taking, uh, so T phi of a linear combination of the EIs is going to be the same linear combination, but with basis vectors which are replaced, so EI is replaced by E phi i. So what they observed is that if you have an expander graph for the graph I just described, the corresponding maps form a dimensional expander. Problem, how do you find uh, maps phi 1 phi d, which produces, uh, which, uh, pro which are monotone in the sense I described, and give you an expander graph. Well, you can do it uh, just by looking at, say, for the maps, shifts. But with shifts, you need to have a d which is like log n, right? If you want to have an expander of bounded degree, you need to have some kind of expansion phenomenon going on there. Now, uh, turned out that, in fact, the object uh, is, is very natural. What you do is that, this is my last, the last one I'm going to show you. Uh, what you do is that, in absence of being able to, being unable to beat the logarithm with shifts, you have to go to something which is a little bit more sophisticated than shifts. So what is more sophisticated than shifts? where well, you look at Möbius transformations. These Möbius transformations have the good idea that, at least locally, uh, you're going to have an, uh, a derivative which is positive, so these maps act locally in, an, in a monotone way. So basically, my maps, my monotone maps, so I pass from the discrete to the continuous, I look at uh, maps which are uh, produced by Möbius transformations with a well-chosen system of elements in SL2R. Well, I want to use representation theory. No, representation theory will introduce me a Jacobian factor because I will have in my, if I, if I look at the projective representation of SL2R, uh, I'm not going to have just a composition with the Möbius transformation. I, I'm going to multiply with the square root of this. So what I need to have are elements of SL2R which are close to the identity so that this, this Jacobian factor, this local, is not going to bother me very much. 
Now, if you have elements which are close to the identity, you, you cannot expect to have good expansion. So I will have to take many of them, and I will have to restrict my functions to a space, to, to the orthogonal complement of some finite dimensional space. So that, together with the theory of expansion, which is now in, in SL2R, but SL2R and SU2, of course, are basically the same. I mean, they have the same complexified Lie algebra. Uh, with, with the same kind of techniques, one can get an, um, a situation of monotone uh, expansion uh, using basically an, an analog of the SU2 theorem that uh, tells you that if we have a system G1, GR in SL2R, so here R is going to be large. That's very important. And uh, we don't have compactness, but we will make an assumption that the norms, at least of the original elements, are not too large, say they are bounded by two. Then we make an assumption which is what I refer to as this non-commutative Diophantin property. So I will take elements uh, which generate a free group. So we have R elements <coughs> generating a free group. And I choose them in such a way, this can be done, that I have an, uh, a Diophantin condition, this is the two there, with a lower bound which depends of course, there will be an R sitting there. The, sorry, the, there will be dependence on R, but it's, it's a decent dependence. And using that, what you can show is that in the uh, projective representation, you're going to have a spectral gap in some sense. Of course, you cannot expect a, a spectral gap without, I mean, making further uh, restrictions on the function f because your g could be close to 1. But I'm going to have a spectral gap when I restrict two functions f which are orthogonal to a certain finite dimensional space E. This finite dimensional space E being not a problem because you can always take care of it by, by small shifts. And I think I went five minutes over time. So thank you very much. Yeah, I remember you asked me this question before. I didn't think about it. I don't know. I don't know. You asked me this question before, but somehow it, it did not. It did not. <laughs> Well, they, they are still working in, in progress uh, in the context, not by myself, but by, by Peter, uh, in the context of more general groups. Uh, if you want, so if you're talking about general modulus, at some point what we are using uh, is this result about stiffness, uh, which is this, uh, this, this problem was posed by Fürstenberg at some point, and then in a more quantitative way by Givarch, which is the analog of the two and the three multiplication, where you take a set of elements in uh, SL, whatever, SLDZ, you let them act on the D-dimensional torus, you take a point, and you want to see how well that point is going to get distributed under the random walk by this group. So our original method gives very precise quantitative information, which is in some sense say, one of the, of the driving elements in, in that argument of proving uniform. So there, there is a case where you have square free moduli, which is a different story, but then how do you deal with the rest? So using the result on square free, which I believe now can be generalized too much, together with that result, you get all the moduli. Now, I'm not really sure. Presumably, the work of Benoit and can, can be developed in a quantitative uh, form like we got it for this special case of actions on Torah. And say so that may be something useful. So I believe everything is there to do that kind of question. It's just that somebody has to do the job. Yes. 
So it's this uh, dimension expander, so the, the way you define uh, the, the transformation PI is, I mean, you can do for any characteristic. You can do for what? For do not make characteristic zero or one, any, any characteristic. Yeah, the field doesn't play. You have to it go back to the, to the argument of uh, the work of Zvira and Spilke. So this has nothing to do with the field. Yeah. So there is some clever point there that shows you that if you have this uh, expander, expander graphs, then you can show that you have this dimension expansion. And this is linear algebra, yeah. independently of the, of the field. Thank you again.